This is the Meat Eater Podcast coming at you shirtless, severely bug bitten, and in my case, underwearless. We hunt the Meat Eater Podcast. You can't predict anything. The Meat Eater Podcast is brought to you by First Light. Whether you're checking trail cams, hanging deer stands, or scouting for elk, First Light has performance apparel to support every hunter in every environment. Check it out at firstlight.com. F I R S T L I T E.com. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're joined by our our, our friend and colleague and uh, I don't know, beloved uh, Arkan Arkansan. What is? How do you say that? <laughs> Arkansan. Arkansan. Clay Newcomb, who's recently back from a trip where he accompanied a wolf trapper in Alaska and made a uh, made a video about hanging out with this Alaska wolf trapper, and um, video's gotten quite a lot of views and generated a lot of conversation. And I wanted to check in with clay about it. And first thing I want to know clay is tell me what you wanted to name it and what they ended up naming it and why. Well, I wanted to, I wanted to just come out and say what the film was about in the title. And I wanted to call it trapping wolves in Alaska or Alaskan or, or Alaskan wolf trapping. Yeah. And that makes sense. we were, we were advised not to do that because of, the potential for YouTube to flag something that had the word trapping in the title. Yep. And so we we ended up calling it Alaskan Wolf Management with Clay Newcomb. Yeah. And th- that, that kind of opens up a can of worms from the very beginning. No, it really of, sets, you know, yeah. I think it sets a, uh, it, it just sets an expectation and delivers a certain dialogue, meaning if you made a squirrel hunting video, which you like to do, which I like to do, and then you had to call it squirrel management in Michigan, you'd be, it'd feel kind of weird. Right. Raccoon management. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, it feels a whole lot more like it's this mission driven yeah. experience a- as if I felt like by me going up there, and trapping a couple of wolves, four wolves actually, that it was gonna, you know, change something. And 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 no doubt that it's a statement in today's world if you go wolf trapping. But it really, I I wanted to, I wanted to experience it. I've known David Bennett's for about ten years. Yeah, that's what I wanted to get into because well, I, well, I don't understand. I was a little hurt because I don't know why he didn't come. It's why the article wasn't beaver trapping with Steve. <laughs> beaver management with steve ranella <laughs> yeah Man, so what uh what what headed the whole thing off or what started so, the whole thing so I, I met david bennett's about 10 years ago through bear hunting magazine oh, okay. he, david's an outfitter david's a professional crabber that's his main livelihood is is crabbing for, for three months during the summer for dungeness, dungeness crab dungeness crabs okay. yeah oh man it, his stories and 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 his learning about that was incredible but he's just like the classic alaskan man he's he's we'll tell him a to stay out of our crabber. area whenever those guys come through our area crabbing gets bad but go on yeah <laughs> yeah david is also a an outfitter so he he guides for you know alaskan big game mm. i would say his primary thing is is black bear and goats but then lastly, in the wintertime, he traps. And he's trapped since he was 10 years old. You know, David's 57 or so. Just in- incredible guy, you know. And he, at times, he's made a lot of money trapping back in the day. Mm-hmm. And, and to this, But to this day, he still traps just as hard as he's ever trapped, just out of principle. Yeah, if he's 57 he and he started trapping when he was 10, he was cranking through the big fur boom i mean he was young but he was selling fur during like the the big fur boom with a capital fb i think it's hard for those guys late 70s early 80s you know my friend Stu miller said to me every generation has its own fur boom and uh (laughs) his his came early man i think those old guys have a hard time letting go of that i mean so much of what we do i think is is fueled by more than just economics and and the buzz that somebody would have gotten back in the day to have made 
a legitimate amount of money trapping furs. Mm -hmm. That association with sustenance for your family, you know, going out and taking furs off the landscape would just almost be hard to erase, it feels to me like. You know, you, you keep doing it even when the prices are cheap. But man, the beaver the beaver market's back though because of these dang felt hats. Oh, I know. Yeah, uh, it is cranky. I'm obsessed with fur. I, I don't want to talk about fur prices, but I don't sell fur. But I'm obsessed with the <laughs> fur market. I follow the fur market more closely than I follow like the stock market. Do you have one of those? Do you have like a graph on your phone that you just can? It doesn't work that flip way. on and and see like the <laughs> no, ups and downs like a stock exchange. No, it doesn't work that way. Hmm. So mm. you reached out to him, and I bet there's no way that he wasn't at first thinking to himself, man, I don't want you and some camera dudes coming into this thing, which is just going to cause me hassle. Guys are going to know where I trap. Guys are going to know how I trap. I'm going to have animal rights people coming after me. Um how did you ever get him to say, yeah, come on out trapping with a camera? You know, I was very conscious of that when I reached out to him. And I honestly feel like David believes that the the authenticity and legitimacy of what he's doing is is able to withstand any criticism that he's taken. Mm-hmm. Um and he, and he also just isn't concerned about giving away secrets. I mean, sometimes guys are like that. David is willing to help anybody he can that, that's wanting to do it. But it's so difficult. I mean, what the film didn't portray and we tried to portray, and you know this because you do stuff like this all the time, Steve, is that it you got to have something driving you that's almost – clinically insane to do what he does i mean being out on the water the distance of these the distance he's traveling the amount of money that he spends on even just his trap sets um it's a very very few people are going to see that video and move to alaska and be a wolf trapper yeah and he knows that and uh and and i told him that we were gonna handle it in a responsible way Mm mm-hmm and I think he just he just took us for our at our word for that, you know. So how did you guys pick the season you were going to go? Um, was he trying to line it up with with peak conditions, with when he doesn't have anything else going on, with when he felt that it was biggest chance of getting like real prime wolf pelts that weren't rubbed out? Right. What was he shooting for when you guys went? So his his year is very regimented down to the week. You know, he can tell you what he's going to be doing any given week of the year. Mm-hmm. And that first week of December, he was going to be trapping wolves whether I was with him or not. Got is it. what he told me. And it, it, yeah, it's it's peak fur. It's but it's also um you know, tough travel conditions that time of year. No daylight. You can <laughs> Oh, that that was the biggest challenge of the whole trip, Steve, and you would know it as much as anybody. Is it gets daylight at about seven thirty a.m., maybe even closer to eight, and it's dark by four thirty. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's like dark, dark. And so, what was wild? So, Dirt Myth was my cameraman on this deal, uh, you know, Garrett Smith, yeah. and he. We would get back to the boat four thirty. And not be needing to be in the boat till eight o'clock the next day, sitting in that little cabin on the uh, on the sandpiper, which we became very familiar with. We'd sit around for six hours, and I don't know what we did: read, eat, pack a big old talk, dip. pack a big dip, probably right. Dirt was <laughs> running through some dip, buddy. You better believe it. I was like, man, what if we run out? And he was like, Clay, I got so much dip in my bag. He's like, I got enough for all of us. And I'm like, I don't dip. I'm out, but appreciate it. <laughs> so what what did the days go like? Uh, he runs a big, like he's running a big, well, first, I guess before we say what the days go like, you should explain, this is a Marine-based deal. He's not running off snowmobiles, trucks. It's It's Marine-based. It's boats. Completely two boats, water based, 
completely water-based trap line. Yeah, so if, if you saw the film, you saw that he has a 48-foot crabbing boat with a cab, a kitchen, you know, fully equipped. We we put that in a small, narrow inlet to get it out of big water and waves, and then we took a skiff out to check the traps. And what is amazing to me, what I would have thought if you would have just said, Clay, you're going to have to go trap wolves in, in, a, in Alaska, how are you going to do it? Coastal Alaska. I would have thought you couldn't trap these wolves on the beach just because they wouldn't have any reason to be there. Mm-hmm. But he's literally catching wolves on the beach in the sand a lot of times. Yeah, um, you know, you only there's the, there salmon. The, they, they, they like it's a peculiar kind of wolf that likes salmon. Dead. I've watched them eating rotten salmon off the beach. Yeah. Well, yeah. They so they're. He feels like they're actually attracted to to these points, mm. these sandy points. He I feels like they just kind of loaf there, you know, like a mallard duck in the timber in the midday, you know, just like loafing. Huh. Okay. But 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 what's what was interesting to me is he said he learned how to catch wolves by watching his Labrador retriever. Okay. He would pull up on a pull up on the bank. And let his dog jump out of the boat, and he would watch what his dog would do. It was a male dog. And he said that dog would pick the, the most prominent visual thing that it could see, whether it was a stump, whether it was a, 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 a clump of grass that set out from the rest of the grass, whether it was a big rock. And he'd go over and he'd mark it, you know, lift his leg and pee on it. Yep. And he, he just started watching that dog, and he started setting traps where he saw his dog mark and started catching wolves. Mm. And he um it's like little scent, so he started doing post sets. That's exact that's what he called them. And we didn't have time, you know, the, the video wasn't like how to trap wolves. So we, we didn't really get into the technical side, but what he uses is is wolf urine. Mm-hmm. A, a, a big big bottle of wolf urine and he'll make an artificial scent post. So he'll go to a beat uh, to a point that he wants to trap on, and he'll go gather up a couple of logs. Now is he working? Some, he, clump some but moss. he's doing this above a, above the high tide mark, or right in where it's getting submerged at high tide. No, most of it's above the high tide mark. Okay. Even though that is a strategy, you know, to to set it below the tide mark, and it's it's like a a drown set, you know. Yep. But most of these, he's just catching. Above the so above up, the up in the line. grass, or yeah. near where there'd be grass. Yeah. Okay. So he yeah. dra- he drags out whatever, drags out some objects to make some visual appeal. I assume. Yeah, and then he and then he puts scent all over it. You know, he puts his he he had multiple commercial wolf lures. Yep. But also this this wolf urine, and uh, th- the biggest thing that I think is different for those guys in Southeast Alaska that are trapping is they don't have to worry about human scent. We we were not worried about human scent at all. What is the thinking like we'd walk Because everything, well, wa- everything gets washed out? It rains. You know, when you're setting a wolf trap, you're, yeah, you're, you, it's going to rain and it's going to wash away the scent. Yeah. And so when the guys in the lower 48 that do some trapping – that's a big concern is how do you pretty much keep the set scent free? So, mm-hmm. you know, they're wearing gloves. They're really concerned about what you're touching. And up there, he's, he's not at all, which is, makes, it, makes it convenient. But his, his you know? traps, his, his, his footholds are dyed and waxed, correct? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. go through making this, like, scent post set. So he drags out. So an object for some visual appeal and places it out on a point. That's right. How big of an object? And so we we showed it. We showed a set in the film. It, it, there was a, probably a, a stump that was 18 inches long or just a piece of log that was 18 inches long and kind of had a big oblong root ball on one side that set up 18 inches tall. And we set it out right out out from the grass in the sand where everything would see it and maybe even put another little smaller four or five inch log on it. And then, you know, you 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 put that scent post in an area where you can dig easily that's not rocky, that's sandy. Yep. And then 
we dig down and set just a stand a standard trap set. I, I'm not a expert trapper. I, I've spent a little bit of time trapping. I know how to make dirt hole sets and catch foxes and coyotes and all this. And I mean, you know, setting these big traps is just identical to that. You know, you're you're trying to well he uses a drag for you know his equipment. He's he's using a drag instead of trying to stake instead the of trying to down. anchor it down. Yeah. Yeah. And so you have to dig a deep, a pretty deep hole to bury that big drag. It, and it is a big drag. And then, you know, you're setting that trap down into a bed where it doesn't wiggle around and the top of the trap has to be even, almost even with the surface of the ground. And how many and inches just, off the, explain how it goes, like how many inches off the post? Because you got to, you're, you're trying to, one of the ways to describe it is you got the whole world you know, the, the animal has the whole world, the whole damn island, whatever to walk around on, and you're trying to get it to put its foot on a, well, in this case, you're trying to get it to put its foot on a two-inch circle, right? So right. if something walks up, if you picture that, let, let's take something that people are more familiar with, like a, a coyote, okay? A coyote's walking down a dirt lane, walking down a farm trail, whatever, and there's an object that it wants to piss on, its feet are going to fall in a specific spot. They're not yeah. going to be two inches off the thing. They're not going to be 30 inches off the thing. He's not going to dance there. He's going to come through, raise his leg, and leave. What are the odds that you've put that trap pan where it's going to put its foot? Yeah. So you're, David, you're, you're like, you're, you're, you're thinking about foot placement and anatomy when you place it. Because if not, you place it wrong. You could have eight wolves run by, and none of them's going to put their foot there. Yeah, you know, I was kind of surprised at how non-technical David's explanation to me of you know where to put the trap. So he's thinking but it, but I, he's not. He's thinking it, but he's not saying it. Probably. Well, I think he's just done it so many times. It's just instinctive. Yeah. But I was expecting him to have a tape measure and be like. The average oh. big southeast Alaska, Alaskan wolf has a stride that's, you know, 14 inches long. So if he's sitting here and he's peeing on that log, he's going to be 16 inches out and slightly back because his, you know, he's peeing from the third, you know, the back third. Of, yeah, what, you know, this technical and nothing. I mean, he just, but probably he was 18 inches off of yeah. the trap. And yeah. I don't think he was targeting a specific foot. I think he's catching a lot of them in the front feet when they come up to sniff the post before they mark it. Mm -hmm. You know, he just just an animal just walking up and putting his nose on that on that little scent log that we made. Um, I don't think he's tech trying to catch it with the back leg. You know, Yo. so he is not as technical as I thought it would be. And what you guys b before he came out, he went out and made a bunch of sets. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. he has some sets out working and then you guys punched in some sets and did some remakes and stuff like that. But how many during your time there and, and explain the number of days you spent there and uh, tell folks how many traps you checked. Okay. Over what, so, di over what distance? We were there for six full days. And in that time, David was concerned that we might not catch a wolf. You know, that that's how this trapping goes. You you might be there for 6 days and not catch a wolf. So by him setting the traps, you know, the day before we got there, you know, we kind of got an extra day. Um and he has 55 sets over a 200 Two, we we mapped it out on Onyx, a 200 mile trap line, boat by water, and but each of those sets might have multiple traps. So he had two kind of sets. He had pee post sets, and what he called bait sets, which were set in tide pools. Mm -hmm. And basically, he would have a chunk of beaver that was elevated above the low tide line, covered in rocks. And then he would have four traps set under the water, just set on the ground, not buried. So even at, under at the, low tide, they're underwater. At low tide, they're underwater. Yep. And but at low tide or mid tide, whatever, the meat's out of the water, but the traps just buried in a tide pool. 
or submerged that's in a correct. tide pool. That's correct. And so we had 55 sets, but each of those sets, most sets had, uh, well, if they were a bait set, they had four traps. So it would be easy to say he had 100 traps out, Yep, I would say. He had 100 traps out. How many, ahead of, how many out ahead of your arrival? He had all of them out. Okay. He had all of them out before we got there. And um, we actually caught four wolves on the trip. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's just showbiz stuff. Like, we just couldn't, we, we couldn't fit in the other two. Um, but we caught, we caught one jet black wolf, which was cool. And, uh, and caught another kind of juvenile gray wolf. So we caught four wolves in a week, which I think that's about what he expected. Mm -hmm. But you can go, you can go a week and not even catch a single animal. Yeah. You know, now a lot of states have check laws, uh, 24 hour check laws, 48 hour check laws. Um, some states have check laws. I should clarify. When I'm talking about a check law, I mean it's like a, a maximum amount of time that you can go without visually inspecting a set. And right. some states just have a flat out check law, 24 hours, 48 hours. Some states have no mention of a check law. And some states have a slightly more nuanced check laws where certain sets don't have a check law, meaning you might be able to set under the ice or underwater with kill sets and not have a check law. But if you're making sets with footholds, dry, dry ground sets with footholds, then there is a check law, meaning that, one, if something goes wrong at your set and you catch something that you're not supposed to catch, you're not leaving it there too long and you're able to release it. Two, being that when you do make a target catch, that you're not leaving it in the trap so long that it might be... Um, regarded by some as being inhumane to leave something caught in a trap for an extended period of time. So to minimize stress, minimize suffering, um, you enforce this check limit. Uh, they don't have a check law and right. he's making some sets that he's leaving for quite some time. What was his perspective on this? That, that he would leave a, 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 a foothold set for a week and could potentially have a catch for a week. Cause y there's two things. One, um, there's a consideration of the animal's well being, And two, there's a consideration of you might not hold it forever. It's going right. to get out, right? The longer it has yeah. the more, it's going to get out. What was his thinking about this? Is it just, is it a matter of logistically, it's just impossible to do it any other way. Um, how, yeah. how did he think about that? That's a good question, and that was one of the first things I we talked about. And he, when he's trapping, that's all he does. Like when when he starts trapping, he is a twenty four hour a day, seven day a week trapper. And I, I, in his mind, he ha, he believes he has an ethical responsibility to check those traps. Is absolutely as much as he can. But if you were there and saw what we were up against with weather, like there are days when you can't get on the water. Mm -hmm. So that, that that's primarily the reason in Alaska that they don't have the check laws is because you're setting, you're setting traps in places that sometimes you just can't physically get to. And so, and, and he also, I think just believes his job is to, to catch wolves and, uh, and and he's track he's track he's checking them as absolutely as much as he can you know avoiding wet I mean if he thinks he's not going to be able to get to traps he won't reset them I mean it, he it's kind of one of these deals where he, you know your own conscience is your god you know and it, and it works good for it, it works good for him I don't think he sees any kind of um pushback from that you know yeah. and that's just the way it is in alaska it, it, that i, I heard some I, I don't people know talking any, about i don't that. know any trappers who love the check laws i can tell you that yeah yeah well man it's uh that's definitely something that some people didn't understand that that watched the film and uh, if you're up there and you're in that boat 
and you met David, you'd you'd get it, you know. What was your feeling when uh, when when all of a sudden like there there's a wolf, you know? And when I asked this, I'm asking from the perspective of um there's a certain creatures that that occupy a lot of mind space, you know? Like you think about them a lot, but you don't get to look at them as much as you think about them. And I remember after always catching glimpses of mountain lions, you know, out out in the wild. I remember the first time I came up on a treed mountain lion where there it is you could actually like really look at it as long as you wanted you know those stunning to be just just to have it be like right there dogs blow it it's in the tree and and this thing that you just you only get glimpses of also was just there in this larger than life kind of way um when you come around the bend or whatever and there's one standing there what are your you know, what What were your thoughts about it? Were you like, man, I hope he uh, gets away or thank God we got one or, you know, like, w- what are the different things yeah. you were feeling? You know, I, I haven't, I haven't interacted with wolves a whole lot. Being mm-hmm. from Arkansas, you know, I, when you and I were in Alaska two years ago, we saw a pack of, I think, 14 wolves that we watched a couple of evenings. Once in Idaho, I saw one cross the road. I haven't I haven't spent a ton of time around wolves. This was definitely the closest I've ever been to one. And it was if I if I didn't say it was slightly conflicted, I'd probably be lying. I, I think um it, it was a just a magnificent beast. I mean, yeah, to be able to walk up to it, look at it. But but what I said in the film I meant is that my confliction was completely fabricated by the confusing messaging of planet earth and humans about wolves. I mean, I was aware of that. Like if, if I was, you know, I, I said that, you know, to sacralize something really is a man-made feature. Mm-hmm. It's not in the natural realm. I mean, that, that wolf, I've killed a lot of deer, a lot of white-tailed deer. And on the ethical spectrum of human existence, me shooting a white-tailed deer is no less different than us dispatching that wolf on the end of a trap. I believe that. But at the same time, this is a very unique animal in a unique place, a unique predator. You know, there are less predators than there are prey animals. I mean, so, I mean, I was just fascinated by it. I'm always fascinated by predators, probably probably in just a generic sense like anybody else would have been, just kind of like a little kid. I mean, when after we dispatched it shot it with a 22 mag um i mean i just walked up to it the dang thing smelled like a dirty wet german shepherd Mm -hmm. and i looked at his claws and just inspected every part of him man and and you know you you can't you got to have respect for them i mean just absolute respect for them and their job what they do making a living out on that landscape and um but at the same time and i said this in the film Honestly, there was little ecological consequence to us taking those two wolves out of that bay. I mean, the one thing that David says, and he and he has, you know, thirty five years of wolf trapping experience to say to to know it is that you can trap, you can trap half the pack, you can trap three quarters of a pack out of a bay, and. Within two years, that pack will be back up mm-hmm. to the same numbers. Like you just can't stomp them down that hard, especially on this coastal trapping. And what he said to me made a lot of sense. Uh, it, and the reason I'm saying all this is it 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 didn't really help the deer that much, and it didn't really hurt the wolves that much. It was just a unique experience where we could extract resource from the land and kind of nobody loses and everybody wins. That's the way I look at it. Yeah. And it, it undoubtedly did it save a couple of deer or moose calves in that cove this year. Yep. Cause those two wolves, they were probably 90 pound males. They're going to eat something and they would have been eating five to seven pounds of meat since that day that we took them out. And because, uh, you know, going back to our original conversation about what we titled this wolf management, like yeah, yeah. as if I'm like trying to make some ecological statement, man, my biggest statement is just 
let us manage them as a as a natural renewable resource. And um, you know, like David said, man, you can't over trap these wolves on the coast because a lot of that big you're only, country you're that only you can see in the, the ed- background, you're only touching the edge. Oh man, you, you're not laying a finger on on the on the wolf population now. But it but it makes some sense. There's some pragmatism in it for these guys that are sick of blacktail deer hunting and moose hunting because they're only hunting the coasts. Like when they go in there to deer hunt, they're just hunting the edges. And so if they can thin wolf populations out along the edges, it helps on a very micro scale. They they truly believe that. Yeah, the, so. the, the conversation around wolf hunting, wolf trapping, any kind of predator stuff, it gets – it gets really confused because a lot of people start throwing away their own realities and, and then putting in these things they half know or suspect to be true or things they've picked up from social media or media in general. For a while, everybody fell in love with this idea that one of them not being true, but this tr- the trophic cascade, right? This, this TED Talk level idea um that by you know wolves being on the landscape they uh cause the riparian areas to to bloom and paradise returned to the greater yellowstone ecosystem and the landscape of fear which drove the elk you know which were inflated numbers of elk and it pushed them into the mountains and so the willows came back and eden returned and that idea was proven to not be true in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, but the re- the refuting that idea didn't get nearly the press as advancing that idea did. Another thing that you know that everyone on the planet feels like, or like you know, everyone in Montana seems to be a born grizzly expert. You know, half of Alaska seems to be born a wolf expert. And they all know this idea of disrupting herd dynamic or disrupting pack dynamics. They don't know it from living. They just know it from having heard about it. And so it becomes this idea they put forth. On the other side of it, people that like to hunt lions or people that trap wolves or hunt wolves will lay in a lot of things like, oh, if I don't do this, they'll be coming to get your pets. Or if I don't mm-hmm. do this, there will be no big game left, which begs the obvious question. If there's no big game left, how would there be predators anyways? Because they rely on big game being there. So I don't believe that they would be able to completely eliminate their food source because that would lead to their own destruction. Um, then you'll have people in the Rockies who are just so upset about wolves being on the landscape because, of course, that means there's no game, but then they like to go hunt in Alaska where wolves occupy about 100% of their historic range. And so if you hate wolves so much and wolves mean there's no game, why would you go to Alaska? They must not have any game because they have wolves. So mm. everyone winds up being, on, on all sides of it, you hear so many people being just intellectually dishonest mm. because they're like, I, someone's saying, I hate to see a predator get killed because um, I, I view them as being special. But I don't want to say that, so I'm going to try to throw you some bogus ecological stuff that I don't really understand. Conversely, Someone would say, I believe that if there's a renewable resource, a renewable, sustainable resource on the landscape, and that we can extract some harvestable surplus off that renewable resource without damaging the resource, I believe that we should have the right to do that. But instead, I'm going to frame it around ideas of the safety of my neighbor's pets, or I'm going to frame it around ideas of um, saving big game from extirpation. Mm-hmm. It invites all this intellectual dishonesty. Yeah. I'm ardently, uh, ardently, unapologetically pro trapping and pro hunting of sustainable resources because they're on the landscape. If we protect the habitat, we'll have surpluses of animals and we can harvest animals 
responsibly and not have a long-term negative impact. Yeah. That's a long way of setting up. The question is, why do you feel people always need to dress this up to dress this dialogue yeah. up and things where they they wind up a, they they wind up role playing, yeah, with what their actual motivations are. Yeah, man, you say that so well. You you, you probably say that better than anybody I've ever heard say it. You know, with kind of an intellectual dishonesty, and I I I, I tried to. I I hope this film portrayed that. I, I don't know if I was fully effective at that or not because I, I didn't go interview a biologist. Like some people criticized the film and said, well, it was just this backyard biology by David Bennett's, you know, just saying, well, there's more deer when we trap out wolves. And, mm-hmm. and uh, so, you know, I did not go interview a biologist. We didn't get into the deep technical, technical research of wolves in that area. And, and I did that on purpose. I wanted to present it like what like what what you said that we, we ought to just be able to go and extract a resource and it not be hurt by it and honestly golly if anybody knows wolves up there it's David and he can tell you they're not hurting the wolf population um what was your original question Steve I got a I, I got the I got sidetracked on my thought there oh it wasn't so much a question as an observation about people's need to, on, on both yeah, sides yeah, of this yeah, yeah. issue, people's need to be a little bit dishonest well, I, or, ref, or or be a little bit like a, assume rhetoric that they don't maybe feel. And and, and I'm and I'm pointing to both sides. It's like I've I've laid I, I've laid yeah. back, like I've really laid out my personal perspective on it, which I said is is unwavering, right? But when yeah. I hear someone, if someone gets a mountain lion and then they and then they get called out on it, and they want to put position that they were doing it out of the best interest of unknown strangers' pets, um, I don't know. I don't think that they yeah. were out there because of their neighbors' pets. Yeah, yeah. Likewise, the thing I've observed in the past, um, people that like to hunt prairie dogs or ground squirrels. And they'll be like, well, I do it for the rancher. And I'll be like, if you wanted to help that rancher, if you went to that rancher's house and you said, man, I'm here to help. What is the number one most effective thing I can do to help you as a rancher? I don't think it's going to be prairie dogs. I think it's going to be fixing fence. Mm -hmm. Look at what he does when he wakes up in the morning. He didn't go grab his two twenty three. and go. <laughs> He's like, by God, I got to get up early tomorrow for prairie dogs. No, it's like, I got to get up. I got to feed cows, check cows, fix fence, do chores. Um, and that's like the thing most top of mind. So yeah, I just, I get a little, I, I just end up getting a little tired of, I end up getting a little tired of the BS, but, but on management though, it, it's, they eat seven pounds of meat a day, right? Um, S- something's dying if they're living. Sure, and it's been proven time again that that predator management, if done in a way that's precise spatially and precise temporally, it's effective. Um, as you're pointing out, you were involved in a kind of non-event, right? No doubt, during the following weeks, some fewer number of deer and moose died. Because they're going to make a kill, you know, a kill or two a week, whatever it is up there. No doubt some fewer prey animals died. No doubt those wolves will be replaced by other wolves who fill in the vacancy in the habitat. And you participated in, you participated in an ecological non-event. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I think, go ahead, go ahead. No, no, that's all. I, I said something that probably confused some people at the end because I think really what in on one side of the the story we're talking about making something sacred and our society since the reintroduction into Yellowstone and you know we have sacralized 
wolves as this animal that is above other animals. This, in, in, in some ways, that's a positive thing. That's a, that's a celebration of this great beast, which humans love to do that. Every culture that's ever lived has sacralized some animal. And I said in my closing statements on this film, I said, I, said, I think as a society, we can, we can sacralize the wolf, but we also need to responsibly be able to trap them and hunt them. I, I think we can have our cake and eat it too. And I think that's what hunters can do. That It's hard for someone to understand. It's like, well, shoot, if you think a wolf's sacred, you don't need to be out trapping them. And man, I think we can do it all. I mean, I, I like to see a wolf and have a sense of awe and have a sense of, wow, this is a special moment. This is a special beast. Like, I, I think that. Like, I don't walk up to it and think this is a non, uh, uh, j- just a, another day in my life, just going to dispatch this wolf. I it, don't know. I, I think we can kind of have our cake and eat it too. I really do. Oh, well, that's at this point, that's proven. It, it's empirically true. Uh, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska have wolves on the ground and they have hunting and trapping seasons for wolves and they're going to continue to have wolves on the ground. Uh, I do some, I do some coyote hunting. I do some coyote trapping. In fact, I'm sitting by a little stringer of coyote pelts hanging on the wall of our studio. I get excited and happy when I see a coyote track. I like running into them. I set out trail cameras specifically to catch images of coyotes. I also like to get some. Those two things are not incompatible. Yeah. And having recovered populations of wolves on the ground and then having some extraction of the resource, these are not incompatible ideas. We do it all of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Let me, can I ask you a question? How do you, do you think us talking about and showing this is beneficial for our cause? Man, I would say, I would say yes. Um, and I'll position it, I'll explain the two perspectives on this stuff. One perspective is that hunters and trappers um, ought to try to hide in plain sight. The idea being that if you carry on your activities and you just hide and keep it secret, the broader world will not realize you're there and they will never mess with you. Um, also this kind of notion that if you don't, if you're off of, so if, if hunters and trappers stay off social media, the broader world won't know you're there and they won't come mess with you. But I invite that perspective. I would invite them to look at a timeline and look at the timeline of the loss of hunting and trapping rights and paste that over a timeline of the introduction of social media. There's no correlation. Mm. Colorado lost track. Like, like look at places losing spring bear hunts, places losing lion hunting, places losing trapping. That's pre-social media. It's Mm. pre-internet for the most part. Colorado lost trapping back in the late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Pre-internet. There's no, like, you can't look and say that the the ability to discuss hunting and trapping has somehow, is somehow correlated to a loss of rights. So, but that's this idea that you should go hide. And if you go hide, no one will ever notice you're there. But you know what? You'll get noticed. You'll get noticed because you have animal rights people that are going to find out about it. You know how I know that? Because they find out about it and they found out about it way before the internet. And yeah. they're going to come after you. Hey, uh, before you say your second thing, 
to me, we have to be the people that tell our story. Yes, like, that, that's that, that's my bot. That's the bottom line. If somebody's going to talk and talk about trapping wolves in Alaska, I want it to be one of us that's doing it. You know, not necessarily me, but I, I want it to be. I want the narrative to be not a spun narrative, but the narrative the way we see it. When I first got into the national bear scene about 10 years ago, I was confronted by the, some of the bear hound guys that were like, hey, we should, you're making a mistake by talking about this. And basically, I was like, I think you're wrong. I think we have to be the ones that tell the story. And I think in a world of social media, it's all the more impetus for us to be the storytellers because if we just went silent, radio silent, media silent, like some people are saying we should do these days, that not we don't have this governing body that can tell all hunters to never post something on the internet, you know, or, or, or somebody's going to do it. And so the worst of us are going to be the storytellers of why something's going to happen. So in a world that now communicates through social media, I mean, I feel like it's all the more important for for us to stand up and, and tell our story in a reasonable way. Yeah, I think it's kind of an absurd request. I mean, I'm a, a writer and a creator, and I'm going to talk about the things I care about. The oldest representational art in the world is people drawing pictures of their hunts. Um, that's, that's not good. I've stop. never heard that said that before. The, the, that's good. The the idea that that somehow these acti- that that somehow hunting and trapping should be removed from any sort of artistic expression or any sort of expository expression to 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 to, to tell people how you view things, what you think about them because it somehow sits outside of what's polite to discuss. It's absurd. Yeah. Like I'm going to talk about the things that I love. I'm going to advance my perspective on things. I'm going to defend the things that matter to me. How, and like, how do I imagine defending the things that matter to me? Do I do it by obfuscating them? Or do I do it by elucidating them, by bringing them to light? I'm like, there's nothing I'm going to take that I'm going to love and I'm going to like obfuscate it out of my love for it. Right. I'm going to illuminate it out of my love for it. And, you know, by us not talking about this stuff, it might work for a generation, but the very nature of it, I mean, today the world communicates with social media bicyclist, guitarist, sports athletes. Like this is the the medium of the world to communicate with our generation. And so if we were exempt from that, it would work for one generation, but the second generation it would it would fail. Like it's not a long-term strategy. Like we have to be relevant. The way for hunters to be less relevant to planet Earth would be for us to be less relevant in the communication of the times. Yeah, I mean, well, like I said, you, you've already seen it happen. I mean, there was a dramatic erosion of the rights of outdoorsmen in the 80s and 90s. This is not a, it's not an internet phenomena. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Clay, I'm glad you joined us for a talk about wolf trapping in Alaska. Wolf management. <laughs> Wolf management, <laughs> Alaska. Wolf management. What's next, man? Uh, is it, Be- it, beavers, it no was doubt, is beaver trip. trapping with Steve. Beaver trap, man. Okay, here's what we do. Me and you. Or we do Mart- trap we beavers. We do Mart- Martin longlining in the mountains, man. Well, uh, we could do that on mules, or no. we beaver trap and follow follow the fur all the way to making a sweet cowboy hat for both of us <laughs> a pair right. of sweet cowboy hats <laughs> no i'm not going i'm going a floppy brim daniel boone hat man yeah his was yeah. Beaver. well he wore beaver felt sure he did that's sure what i'm did. saying i mean i just mean like a beaver felt yeah all right well thanks for coming I, oh go ahead 
Yeah, man. Thanks, Steve. Oh, appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you coming on, Clay. Thanks a lot, man.